Chapter 6 Winter Here's what I do on the first day of snowfall every year. I step out of the house early in the morning, still in my pyjamas, hugging my arms against the chill. I find the driveway, my father's car, the walls, the trees, the rooftops and the hills buried under a foot of snow. I smile. The sky is seamless and blue, the snow so white my eyes burn. I shovel a handful of the fresh snow into my mouth, listen to the muffled stillness broken only by the cawing of crows. I walk down the front steps barefoot and call for Hassan to come out and see. Winter was every kid's favourite season in Kabul, at least those whose fathers could afford to buy a good iron stove. The reason was simple. They shut down school for the icy season. Winter to me was the end of long division and naming the capital of Bulgaria, and the start of three months of playing cards by the stove with Hassan, free Russian movies on Tuesday mornings at Cinema Park, sweet turnip kurma over rice for lunch after a morning of building snowmen. And kites, of course. Flying kites and running them. For a few unfortunate kids, winter did not spell the end of the school year. There were the so-called voluntary winter courses. No kid I ever knew volunteered to go to these classes. Parents, of course, did the volunteering for them. Fortunately for me, Baba was not one of them. I remembered one kid, Ahmad, who lived across the street from us. His father was some kind of doctor, I think. Ahmad had epilepsy and always wore a wool vest and thick black-rimmed glasses. He was one of Asef's regular victims. Every morning, I watched from my bedroom window as their Hazara servants shoveled snow from the driveway, cleared the way for the black opal. I made a point of watching Ahmed and his father get into the car. Ahmed, in his wool vest and winter coat, his school bag filled with books and pencils. I waited until they pulled away, turned the corner. Then I slipped back into bed in my flannel pyjamas. I pulled the blanket to my chin and watched the snow-capped hills in the north through the window. Watched them until I drifted back to sleep. I loved wintertime in Kabul. I loved it for the soft pattering of snow against my window at night. For the way fresh snow crunched under my black rubber boots. For the warmth of the cast-iron stove as the wind screeched through the yards, the streets. But mostly because, as the trees froze and ice sheathed the roads, the chill between Baba and me thawed a little. And the reason for that was the kites. Baba and I lived in the same house, but in different spheres of existence. Kites were the one paper-thin slice of intersection between those spheres. Every winter, districts in Kabul held a kite-fighting tournament, and if you were a boy living in Kabul, the day of the tournament was undeniably the highlight of the cold season. I never slept the night before the tournament. I'd roll from side to side, make shadow animals on the wall, even sit on the balcony in the dark, a blanket wrapped around me. I felt like a soldier trying to sleep in the trenches the night before a major battle. And that wasn't so far off. In Kabul... Fighting kites was a little like going to war. As with any war, you had to ready yourself for battle. For a while, Hassan and I used to build our own kites. We saved our weekly allowances in the fall, dropped the money in a little porcelain horse Baba had brought one time from Herat. When the winds of winter began to blow and snow fell in chunks, we undid the snap under the horse's belly. We went to the bazaar and bought bamboo, glue, string and paper. We spent hours every day shaving bamboo for the center and crossbars, cutting the thin tissue paper which made for easy dipping and recovery. And then, of course, we had to make our own string, or tar. If the kite was the gun, then tar, the glass-coated cutting line, was the bullet in the chamber. We'd go out in the yard and feed up to 500 feet of string through a mixture of ground glass and glue. We'd then hang the line between the trees, leave it to dry. The next day, we'd wind the battle-ready line around a wooden spool. By the time the snow melted and the rains of spring swept in, 
Every boy in Kabul bore tell-tale horizontal gashes on his fingers from a whole winter of fighting kites. I remember how my classmates and I used to huddle, compare our battle scars on the first day of school. The cut stung and didn't heal for a couple of weeks, but I didn't mind. They were reminders of a beloved season that had once again passed too quickly. Then the class captain would blow his whistle, and we'd march in a single file to our classrooms, longing for winter already, greeted instead by the spectre of yet another long school year. But it quickly became apparent that Hassan and I were better kite fighters than kite makers. Some flaw or other in our design always spelled its doom. So Baba started taking us to Saifau's to buy our kites. Saifau was a nearly blind old man who was a moochie by profession, a shoe repairman. But he was also the city's most famous kite maker, working out of a tiny hovel on Jader Mewand, the crowded street south of the muddy banks of the Kabul River. I remember you had to crouch to enter the prison cell-sized store, and then had to lift a trap door to creep down a set of wooden steps to the dank basement where Saifau stored his coveted kites. Bubba would buy us each three identical kites and spools of glass string. If I changed my mind and asked for a bigger and fancier kite, Bubba would buy it for me. But then he'd buy it for her son, too. Sometimes I wished he wouldn't do that. Wished he'd let me be the favourite. The kite-fighting tournament was an old winter tradition in Afghanistan. It started early in the morning on the day of the contest and didn't end until only the winning kite flew in the sky. I remember one year the tournament outlasted daylight. People gathered on sidewalks and roofs to cheer for their kids. The streets filled with kite fighters jerking and tugging on their lines, squinting up to the sky, trying to gain position to cut the opponent's line. Every kite fighter had an assistant, in my case Hassan who held the spool and fed the line. One time, a bratty Hindi kid whose family had recently moved into the neighbourhood told us that in his hometown, kite-fighting had strict rules and regulations. You have to play in a boxed area, and you have to stand at a right angle to the wind, he said proudly, and you can't use aluminium to make your glass string. Hassan and I looked at each other, cracked up, the Hindi kid would soon learn what the British learned earlier in the century and what the Russians would eventually learn by the late 1980s, that Afghans are an independent people. Afghans cherish custom, but abhor rules. And so it was with kite fighting. The rules were simple. No rules. Fly your kite, cut the opponents, good luck. Except that wasn't all. The real fun began when a kite was cut. That was where the kite runners came in. Those kids who chased the wind-blown kite drifting through the neighbourhoods until it came spiralling down in a field, dropping in someone's yard on a tree or a rooftop. The chase got pretty fierce. Hordes of kite runners swarmed the streets, shoved past each other like those people from Spain I'd read about once, the ones who ran from the bulls. One year... A neighbourhood kid climbed a pine tree for a kite. A branch snapped under his weight and he fell thirty feet, broke his back and never walked again. But he fell with the kite still in his hands, and when a kite runner had his hands on a kite, no one could take it from him. That wasn't a rule. That was custom. For kite runners, the most coveted prize was the last fallen kite of a winter tournament. It was a trophy of honour something to be displayed on a mantle for guests to admire. When the sky cleared of kites and only the final two remained, every kite runner readied himself for the chance to land this prize. He positioned himself at a spot that he thought would give him a head start. Tense muscles readied themselves to uncoil. Necks craned, eyes crinkled, fights broke out. And when the last kite was cut, all hell broke loose. Over the years, I'd seen a lot of guys run kites, but Hassan was by far the greatest kite runner I'd ever seen. It was downright eerie the way he always got to the spot the kite would land before the kite did, as if he had some sort of inner compass. 
I remember one overcast winter day, Hassan and I were running a kite. I was chasing him through neighborhoods, hopping gutters, weaving through narrow streets. I was a year older than him, but Hassan ran faster than I did, and I was falling behind. Hassan, wait! I yelled, my breathing hot and ragged. He whirled around, motioned his hand. This way! he called, before dashing around another corner. I looked up, saw that the direction we were running was opposite to the one the kite was drifting. We're losing it! We're going the wrong way! I cried out. Trust me! I heard him call up ahead. I reached the corner and saw Hassan bolting along, his head down, not even looking at the sky, sweat soaking through the back of his shirt. I tripped over a rock and fell. I wasn't just slower than Hassan, but clumsier too. I'd always envied his natural athleticism. When I staggered to my feet, I caught a glimpse of Hassan disappearing around another street corner. I hobbled after him, spikes of pain battering my scraped knees. I saw we had ended up on a rutted dirt road near Istiklal Middle School. There was a field on one side where lettuce grew in the summer, and a row of sour cherry trees on the other. I found Hassan sitting cross-legged at the foot of one of the trees, eating from a fistful of dried mulberries. What are we doing here? I panted, my stomach roiling with nausea. He smiled. Sit with me, Amiraga. I dropped next to him, lay on a thin patch of snow, wheezing. You're wasting our time. It was going the other way, didn't you see? Hassan popped a mulberry in his mouth. It's coming, he said. I could hardly breathe, and he didn't even sound tired. How do you know? I said. I know. How can you know? He turned to me. A few sweat beads rolled from his bald scalp. Would I ever lie to you, Amiraga? Suddenly I decided to toy with him a little. I don't know. Would you? I'd sooner eat dirt, he said with a look of indignation. Really? You'd do that? He threw me a puzzled look. Do what? Eat dirt if I told you to, I said. I knew I was being cruel, like when I'd taunt him if he didn't know some big word. But there was something fascinating, albeit in a sick way, about teasing Hassan. Kind of like when we used to play insect torture, except now he was the ant and I was holding the magnifying glass. His eyes searched my face for a long time. We sat there, two boys under a sour cherry tree, suddenly looking, really looking at each other. That's when it happened again. Hassan's face changed. Maybe not changed, not really. But suddenly I had the feeling I was looking at two faces. The one I knew, the one that was my first memory, and another, a second face, this one lurking just beneath the surface. I'd seen it happen before. It always shook me up a little. It just appeared, this other face, for a fraction of a moment, long enough to leave me with the unsettling feeling that maybe I'd seen it someplace before. Then Hassan blinked, and it was just him again, just Hassan. If you asked, I would, he finally said, looking right at me. I dropped my eyes. To this day I find it hard to gaze directly at people like Hassan, people who mean every word they say. But I wonder, he added, would you ever ask me to do such a thing, Amiraga? And just like that he had thrown at me his own little test. If I was going to toy with him and challenge his loyalty, then he'd toy with me, test my integrity. I wished I hadn't started this conversation. I forced a smile. Don't be stupid, Hassan. You know I wouldn't. Hassan returned the smile, except his didn't look forced. I know, he said. And that's the thing about people who mean everything they say. They think everyone else does, too. Here it comes, Hassan said, pointing to the sky. He rose to his feet and walked a few paces to his left. I looked up, saw the kite plummeting towards us. I heard footfalls, 
shouts, an approaching melee of kite runners. But they were wasting their time, because Hassan stood, his arms wide open, smiling, waiting for the kite. And may God, if he exists, that is, strike me blind, if the kite didn't just drop into his outstretched arms. In the winter of 1975, I saw Hassan run a kite for the last time. Usually, each neighborhood held its own competition, but that year, the tournament was going to be held in my neighborhood, Wazir Akbar Khan, and several other districts, Katecha, Katepawan, Mekro Rayan, and Kotesangi, had been invited. You could hardly go anywhere without hearing talk of the upcoming tournament. Word had it, this was going to be the biggest tournament in twenty-five years. One night that winter, with the big contest only four days away, Baba and I sat in his study in overstuffed leather chairs by the glow of the fireplace. We were sipping tea, talking. Ali had served dinner earlier, potatoes and curried cauliflower over rice, and had retired for the night with Hassan. Baba was fattening his pipe, and I was asking him to tell the story about the winter a pack of wolves had descended from the mountains in Herat and forced everyone to stay indoors for a week, when he lit a match and said casually, I think maybe you'll win the tournament this year. What do you think? I didn't know what to think, or what to say. Was that what it would take? Had he just slipped me a key? I was a good kite fighter, actually a very good one. A few times I'd even come close to winning the winter tournament. Once I'd made it to the final three. But coming close wasn't the same as winning, was it? Baba hadn't come close. He had won, because winners won and everyone else just went home. Baba was used to winning, winning at everything he set his mind to. Didn't he have a right to expect the same from his son? And just imagine, if I did win. Baba smoked his pipe and talked. I pretended to listen. But I couldn't listen, not really, because Baba's casual little comment had planted a seed in my head, the resolution that I would win that winter's tournament. I was going to win. There was no other viable option. I was going to win, and I was going to run that last kite. Then I'd bring it home and show it to Baba, show him once and for all that his son was worthy. Then maybe my life as a ghost in this house would finally be over. I let myself dream. I imagined conversation and laughter over dinner instead of silence, broken only by the clinking of silverware and the occasional grunt. I envisioned us taking a Friday drive in Baba's car to Pagman, stopping on the way at the Gargar Lake for some fried trout and potatoes. We'd go to the zoo to see Marjan, the lion, and maybe Baba wouldn't yawn and Steele looks at his wristwatch all the time. Maybe Baba would even read one of my stories. I'd write him a hundred if I thought he'd read one. Maybe he'd call me Amir Jan, like Rahim Khan did. And maybe, just maybe, I would finally be pardoned for killing my mother. Baba was telling me about the time he'd cut fourteen kites on the same day. I smiled, nodded, laughed at the right places, but I hardly heard a word he said. I had a mission now, and I wasn't going to fail, Baba. Not this time. It snowed heavily the night before the tournament. Hassan and I sat under the kursi and played punch pa as wind rattled tree branches tapped on the window. Earlier that day, I had asked Ali to set up the kursi for us, which was basically an electric heater under a low-covered table with a thick quilted blanket. Around the table he arranged mattresses and cushions so as many as twenty people could sit and slip their legs under. Hassan and I used to spend entire snowy days snug under the kursi, playing chess, cards, mostly punch par. I killed Hassan's ten of diamonds, played him two jacks and a six, Next door, in Baba's study, Baba and Rahim Khan were discussing business with a couple of other men. One of them I recognized as a Seth's father. Through the wall, I could hear the scratchy sound of radio carbal news. 
Hassan killed the six and picked up the jacks. On the radio, Daoud Khan was announcing something about foreign investments. He says someday we'll have television in Kabul, I said. Who? Daoud Khan, you ask, the president. Hassan giggled. I heard they already have it in Iran, he said. I sighed. Those Iranians... For a lot of Hazaras, Iran represented a sanctuary of sorts. I guess because, like Hazaras, most Iranians were Shia Muslims. But I remembered something my teacher had said that summer about Iranians, that they were grinning smooth talkers who patted you on the back with one hand and picked your pocket with the other. I told Baba about that, and he said my teacher was one of those jealous Afghans. Jealous because Iran was a rising power in Asia, and most people around the world couldn't even find Afghanistan on a world map. It hurts to say that, he said, shrugging, but better to get hurt by the truth than comforted with a lie. I'll buy you one someday, I said. Hassan's face brightened. A television? In truth? Sure. And not the black and white kind, either. We'll probably be grown-ups by then, but I'll get us two, one for you and one for me. I'll put it on my table where I keep my drawings, Hassan said. His saying that made me kind of sad. Sad for who Hassan was, where he lived, for how he had accepted the fact that he'd grow old in that mud shack in the yard, the way his father had. I drew the last card, played him a pair of queens and a ten. Hassan picked up the queens. You know, I think you're going to make Aga Saib very proud tomorrow. You think so? Inshallah, he said. Inshallah, I echoed, though the God-willing qualifier didn't sound as sincere coming from my lips. That was the thing with Hassan. He was so goddamn pure, you always felt like a phony around him. I killed his king and played him my final card, the Ace of Spades. He had to pick it up. I'd won. But as I shuffled for a new game, I had the distinct suspicion that Hassan had let me win. Amir Aga. What? You know, I like where I live. He was always doing that, reading my mind. It's my home. Whatever, I said. Get ready to lose again. <laughs>